Um, next week is Vision Sunday. I'm excited about it. A little different than we've done before. A little different vision. Uh, we won't go into that today. But one of the things that God is working on me this year is to look at Scripture differently. Uh, how many know that we see things characteristic? We characteristic. The characteristics of things are the way we see them sometimes. Uh, if you grew up not believing in women preachers, every time a woman stands up to preach, something in you goes, ah! If you grew up vegetarian and God revealed to you that it's okay to eat meat, the first time you reach down for a burger, you go, ah! I mean, see people in Scripture that doubting, what was his name? Thomas. Ah! Oh, nobody knows anything good that Thomas did. Everybody knows he's Doubting Thomas, right? We know exactly the negative of things. And sadly, we look at Scripture most of the time blind. And I'm not telling you to change your theology, but what I'm telling you that God is doing with me is to take it exactly the way I know it and look at it from a different angle. See it from a different angle. Now, us preachers, sometimes we get high and mighty, if you will, and we believe we've conquered it all. The pastor says, turn to him. We go, uh -huh. I know where he's going with this. But at the end of the day, that's part of the problem is we take Scripture and we put it in a box. Now, I'm not talking about changing theology, changing who Christ is, but looking at things from the other side and seeing where they're at. If you've been delivered from something, it's easy for you to say to someone else, you can break free from that. But you don't know the struggle they've got going on in that. If you look at it from their side, they're free of things that you're not free of yet. So it's time for God's people to let the Holy Spirit expand our eyesight when it comes to God's Word. If you believe that, say, hey. 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 Ah. You don't know what that is, that's a southern carburetor preacher. <laughs> you know what a carburetor preacher is, right? That's one of the ones that get, and the Lord, I said, ha, 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 Because they're trying to talk so fast, they suck an air in between everyone like an old carburetor. Never mind. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We're studying Revelation on uh, Wednesday nights, if you want to come out. This week we'll be looking at the image of Christ from chapter 1. So we won't dig into this massively deep today, but I want you to look at it for just a little bit with me. Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at one church. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, stand for the reading of God's Word. If you have one of those crazy Bibles like I do, the letters are in red. That means this is Jesus speaking. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, <coughs> and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Brother Nichols, will you bless the reading of the word? Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord. Let us look at it from the perspective in which you would have us, Lord. Lord, I ask that you uh, bless the pastor as he blesses us in your name. Amen. Thank you. I need all the blessing I can get. Amen. 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 Seated. <laughs> People don't like to hear this because we love to do things like 2020 vision and we like to do things like uh, God's about to do a new thing and God does a new thing sometimes in the midst of the old thing. But in Scripture, everything's about patterns. From Genesis to Revelation, 
Everything's about pattern. God works in patterns in everything that he does. So God doesn't break his own patterns and his own cycles and the way that, that things go. So if I look at the seven churches of Revelation, here is a pattern to those churches. They're on, honey. It's hot in here. Uh, I had a jacket before service, before first service. And I'm like, it is just, it's hot in here. I know. Uh, the first thing he does to every church is he addresses the particular congregation. Then an introduction of who he is, he addresses that. He shows who he is differently to every single church. And then there's a statement regarding the condition of the church, then a verdict of Jesus to the church, a command from Jesus, a general exhortation, and then a promise of reward. Now knowing that that pattern's the same, how many have ever read about the churches in Revelation? So the seven churches represent, or we believe they represent, the, the whole of the church, the entire church. Some would tell you that it's dispensations of time and that we're in the time of the Laodicean or the seventh church. And that, that literally that means that we are the lazy church, if you will, or the lukewarm church, if you will. Uh, each of those are, uh, are, are the way people perceive those. How do they perceive this church? Let's be real. The way I perceive this church and most people is they're the church that lost their first love. They're the church that lost their first love. Now, what does that mean? It means simply this right here. They're the church, and he says to them, you've lost your first love. And if you would admit it, there's a probability that there was a time in your life that your walk with God might have been a little more intense than it is right now in your life. There was a time when there was an intimacy in the marriage of you and Christ that was so intense you, you couldn't wait to, to speak. You couldn't wait to read His Word. And now life has kind of gotten in the way. Like the hindering spirit that blocked some of you this morning from getting what God wanted you to have already. Because truth is, it gets in the way. And they say to them, this is the church that lost their first love. And that's kind of the way I've always seen it. But I want to look at it the way He showed it to me today. If we can. Let's start at the first. To the angel or the messenger of the church at Ephesus. You ought to look the words of these churches up. We won't today, but it's interesting what each church means. And Ephesus right there actually means to the people of the church. It's actually individuals he's speaking to. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars. In Revelation 1, he tells us that he held the seven stars in his hand. That Jesus held the seven stars in his hand and that he walked among the seven golden candlesticks. And it literally is saying right here in the very first part that he is relating this to the seven churches. And he says to him that holdeth the seven churches. And the word holdeth is one I've never really broke down until now. And as I begin to do this and God begin to show me that word holdeth is krato in the Greek language. And do you know what it simply means? It means when he's talking to this church, to him that will not discard it, that will not let go, that actually still has his hand on it. Now, how have I perceived this church? They're the ones that lost their first love. They're the ones that literally fell away because they didn't love him the same. But the very first thing out of his mouth is, he says, I have not let go of them yet. I have not loosed my hand from them yet. If that's you that's been all over the place and you lost it and gained it and lost it and gained it, you ought to give him a shout right now that he has not let go of you. That he is still holding on to you. Oh, i got to be good. He says he holds the seven stars and he literally says to them, that word krato means to have power over, to obtain, to not discard. And I'm thinking, but Lord, you just said they lost their first love, that they needed to repent and return to you. And he said, read it again. And I said, I just read it. You ever argue with God? I, this is one of my famous things to do is argue with God. I mean, this is a daily, weekly thing with me. I argue with God. He says, let's go here. I go, let's go there. Right? And he said, read it again. He said, I never let go. I hold. Krato. He said, I'm the one that holds the seven stars. And it, the word, the Greek word is emphatic. And it represents Christ holding the church in his hand. And he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you can't bear those who are evil, that you test those who say they're apostles and they're not. And then this jumps off the page. He says, I know that you haven't fainted. 
I know that you've been weary. I know that you're tired. I know that your relationship with me is not what it once was. But I know that you've never let go. I never saw that before, Jim, because I've been that guy. I remember when Brian Cutshaw was preaching in Cleveland, Tennessee. He was preaching camp meeting, and he said, you know what? I turned around, and I said, God, where are you? And seven years later, I'm still pastoring, but I can't find God anymore. And I'm thinking, how could you do that and be a pastor? Hello, I know how he did that now because it's almost like God steps back or something. And But here he said, I still, and you're, he, the things that I've heard my whole life is these are the church that fell away because they lost their first love. And he said, yes, you're not in the place where you once were, but you never gave up on me, and I will never, ever, ever give up on you. See, the enemy's biggest tool is to convince us that we're not good enough for God, that our mistakes are what literally destroys us. And what destroys us is buying what the enemy says. It's not that our mistake, yes, it separates us. There's no once saved, always saved, whether you like it or not. It's not there, but reality is this. He said in this scripture, straight out of the scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, he said to them, you have not fainted. Move on. Where am I at? Lost my notes. <laughs> and then he says, nevertheless, what the church is known for, I have this against you. You lost your first love. It's the message to the church. You lost your first love. And then he says, but remember from where you were fallen. And I say to God right here, aha, they did fall away. You just said so. And he says, remember that you have fallen, repent, and do the first works. Aha! They fell away, right? That's what the book says. He says, keep reading. And then it says, or else. He said, you're not to a point yet where I pull the or else trigger. He said, I'm warning you so that you don't get there. And all the while I thought, they lost it. And he said, I said they had fallen in their love for me, but or else means that they're still at a point where I can still bring them in, where I can still work with them. John Bevere said his kryptonite was pornography. He said it literally crushed him. He's one of the greatest preachers on the earth right now. He said it crushed me, but God never let go of me, and I kept struggling and fighting. And he said it was like kryptonite. It pulled me down. And I'm thinking, you know what? How many past kryptonite that is trying to hold them down, yet they still have enough of God and they have not let go and he has not let go of them and they stand up with everything they have and they pour their heart out to the people of God that the enemy has told that they're never going to make it and God is telling them, I haven't got to or else yet. I'm still holding on to you. I'm seeing this for the first time like this and I'm, because I'm, I'm one of those people that I know it don't try to tell me any different. And sadly I say that to God more than I do anybody. Don't confuse me with the facts. That's good. And he says or else in other words he said otherwise I will come and remove your candlestick. You mean what you're saying, Lord, is I still have a little light left. You're saying, even though I'm not where you want me to be, even though I feel like I failed you so bad, even though the old enemies told me, even though I'm ready to quit, you're saying there's still a light? You're saying that there's still a light? And I'm thinking, God, how could there still be a light? And he says, fix those things and let's move on. Then he gives them credit. Does 
and what they got right. They hate those that destroy. And then he says, if you have ears, hear. He said, if you have ears, this is not a condemnation to you. It's where he attaches the churches throughout the book. He does it. And then the word Nikaio, or Nikaio, however you pronounce it. To him that overcomes. And he began to show me this word this week. And he began to question me. And he began to ask me questions. And I'm like, Lord, I understand this. To him that overcomes. To him that continues in. That's what the word means. I got it. I got it. He said, okay, well then explain it to me. I said, if we can just overcome the world. He said, read what it said. To him that continues in. That's what the word means. He said, what do you continue in? You cannot continue in what you do not have. You cannot continue in what you do not have. And the enemy has stolen so many lives over the years because he has convinced us that we don't have anything anymore. God did not say repent and return. He said repent and continue. In other words, what he said to us today is you're not too far gone. There is hope. Amen. I take health issues. I take that scale back there. I've lost a belt loop. I can breathe better than I have been forever. My sugar numbers are in better shape. But that evil monster back there tells me something different. I have to do this more. I'm, I'm breathing better. I ran a mile or jogged a mile yesterday morning after being on the other machines and rowing for 12 minutes. In under 16 minutes, which for me is amazing. And I'm thinking, that little monster is going to dictate whether I give up or not. And we take one life and we dictate an entire message to a church when the message, if I will stop and think outside the box, is him saying, I have left you. I still got a hold of you. You haven't given up on me yet. While you may not be where I want you to be exactly, I still have my hand on you. And I don't want to turn you loose. And until you continue down that path, if you will go this path, I will not. And he says, continue. You cannot continue what you don't have. And sometimes even the church wants to crucify those that fall to sin. We want to crucify the drug addict and we want to crucify the one that's struggling with pornography or any other thing or, or this addiction or that addiction and Christ is saying there's still a flicker of light. I see it like this rock. I see him going and he's blowing on that little flicker that's left <laughs> He didn't say I gave up on you. He didn't say you'd lost it all. What he said is, let me breathe fresh life into you. Let me restore that love union between you and me. Let me draw you back in. Let me feed you the Holy Spirit fire. Let me restore. And all the while, I'm looking at churches like the lukewarm church that he's about to spew out. You know what about means? He ain't thrown up yet. Doesn't mean he threw you up. Doesn't mean he spit you out. It means he hadn't spit you out yet. Church, don't listen to the enemy this morning. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. Don't listen to the enemy when he, he says you're not going to get better. What did God say? Don't listen to the enemy when he says depression, depression wins this fight. What did God say? Right now, what you're going through in your life, God is breathing on, fighting against what the enemy is coming to you with. He is breathing fresh Ruach, Holy Spirit, onto you. And he wants to break the bonds. And yet... This morning we come to church and we are so distraught. And we literally have the cares of the world. The mistakes we made weighing on our heart. I tried so hard but I failed. 
God, I'm not worthy of anything. He says, shh, shh, repent. Let me breathe on you. Oh, yeah, you didn't fall away. You're still fighting. Come on. Come on, we got this. And I'm thinking, my God, when I begin to look at the seven churches, you don't warn somebody that's already fallen. It's too late to warn them. You warn them to keep them from going over the rest of the edge. You warn them to tell them. <coughs> The word revelation means, those of you who know this that have been here on Wednesday nights, but it, it doesn't mean it's apocalyptic and it doesn't mean the end of the world. Get that garbage out of your head. That's a Western culture. It means to unveil. It means to reveal. What does it reveal? The good things that God wants for your life. He warns you of the bad things that are coming. But when you give up hope, you lose. But one time he says you've lost your first love, and four times he says I'm holding on. Think about it. How many of us in this room need a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit to breathe on us? How many of us feel like maybe that God is so far away, like I haven't heard an answer, and I don't know... How many of us argue with him every day and he smiles and says, we got this? How many of us have junk in our lives that we've brought in? How many of us have junk that the enemy's brought in? How many of us just need God to say, you know what, there's still a flame. Don't you dare give up now. Don't you quit now. You continue. You press. You push. Don't you dare back down. isn't about him blotting out your name and it isn't about him pulling your candlestick out and it isn't about him spewing you out it's about continuing with what little bit you may have left to move forward with everything that God has for you I don't know who else feels or has felt like that you're not getting anywhere come to tell you today that God is moving you forward whether you know it or not. Amen. Ministry may not look like you think it should. And then someone you haven't seen in two years said, I missed you so desperately. I love the fact that you bring spirit light into my life. Not a Christian. It says, I just want to thank you for bringing a light into my life. And you're like, God, He says, just come on. Continue. We got this. And the scale don't mean as much. I'm on the last belt loop. It's been two years since I've seen that belt. Lose till you lose hope. 
said wait, you're in no taking wait. If God said press, press. If God says repent, then repent from your sin and move on forward. But don't let the enemy drag you down into guilt of the problems you made because that's not what God is doing in your life. He convicts you of the sin to move you forward. There is hope in every word from God. Don't let the enemy steal that. If you're battling depression, you lift your head up right now and go, you know what? I'm still battling. Amen. If you're battling anxiety and fear, you lift your head up and you say, I'm still fighting. And God is about to breathe fresh fire on my fight. And I'm about to see a victory. Family, if you will. Did you know that Adam Thomas was one of the greatest 12? He was in the top 12. Maybe we should just take doubting off of his name. Just say the disciple named Thomas. Because it wasn't him that failed. It was him that struggled. He didn't fail. It was Judas that failed. Thomas didn't fail. And while we look at him as doubting, God looks at him as a victor, a winner, victorious. I don't think we're going to call him that anymore. <coughs> Top 12 is pretty good, isn't it? Father, I want to thank you today for breathing life. I pray that some semblance of what you gave me bleeds over onto your people. God, I can't speak the way that you do, but I give everything I've got. God, I'm asking your Holy Spirit to minister to those that are hurting today. Maybe to those that are lost and need a Savior, need to be saved. To those that are struggling because they haven't received the spirit baptism or even struggling with what it is. To those that are fighting anxiety and depression. And the enemy has messed our minds up so bad. God, I'm asking you to put a hedge of protection around our minds. Let us read life in every word. For those that are willing to come today, dear Lord, I pray if there be any that be fresh on them today. Let a fresh anointing fall on them today. In your precious and holy name. This altar is open for every day. He's going to play a song uh, called Fight On Fighter. Don't let anyone steal your fire. Come on, altar's open.